to Pocketables Weekly News Roundup number 14. Um, we've got a lot of things to go through, so this is probably going to be one of our longer news posts in recent weeks. But first, I want to actually take a minute and cut over to Matt, one of the contributing editors at Pocketables. And uh, he's got some announcements for a live stream he's going to be doing on Monday. I'm going to be tuning in and watching it myself. There'll be a link to more information in the description, but let's hear from Matt. Hey guys, Matt here. On Monday, the 16th of November, which means, hey, next Monday at 6.30 p.m. sharp, that's GMT time. So for you American friends, that's going to be 1.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. If you live in California, you have to do the calculation yourself. Uh, Banggood will host my live stream, which means for about an hour, I'll be having a live stream for them, talking about different products and giving away pretty decent codes uh, to have purchases a little bit cheaper. And uh, four different products I'll be talking about. First of all, I have two 3D printers, one resin and one filament printer from Creality. If you are on the market for one, you probably want to tune in and watch this. Second of all, there is a 15.6 inch display which is 4K, has a touch, and you can put it inside your bag and take it with you. Yes, it's portable, it's uh, inexpensive, and actually quite decent. Lastly, I've got this. This is Insta360 Go, and let me just put it this way. Stabilization on this is amazing, and I'll be talking more about this product soon as well. If you missed the live stream, don't worry. I'll definitely gonna put some of the reviews on pocketables.com, so you'll get a chance to read them all. Until then, guys, enjoy your Friday catch up. All right. Thank you, Matt. Um, with that out of the way, like I said, I'll be tuning into that. Let's jump right into some of the smaller items that we've got. Um, so MSI, I don't know if anyone has seen this. It's been circulating for a couple of days at this point. Had a fire at one of their PCB factories in... Uh, I'm going to mispronounce the name on this, so I'll just say there's a link to more information on it. They had a link fire in one of their PCB factories in China. And they're claiming, you know, no injuries, no production impact, none of that. Um, whether or not some of that's true remains to be seen. I mean, anyone's going to claim that things aren't impacted to protect their investments and whatnot. Um although I'm sure the lack of injuries is certainly accurate. They don't really have any reason to lie about that. Uh, I know we've clashed with MSI before. I completely tore into them on my social media uh, about just the lack of quality on one of their graphics cards, but I genuinely hope that everyone does well. I don't really begrudge them anything or want to see anything go wrong here. So hopefully everything recovers, and if production was impacted, uh, it picks back up soon so that they can uh, keep up with demand on both the new 3000 series cards from NVIDIA and the upcoming 6000 series cards from AMD. Apple, who's going to be in the news, well, let's just talk about Apple. So first up, one of Apple's suppliers got caught using labor that they shouldn't be in China. Um, and the supplier is Pegatron. Pegatron doesn't just supply parts for Apple. Pegatron is a big supplier that makes things for, you know, Apple, Dell, Lenovo, HP. Everybody goes to Pegatron for various things. Um, so this is a, a labor violation that Pegatron's probably going to be fined for. And uh, there'll likely be additional oversight after the fact. As far as how this is going to impact any of the vendors who use Pegatron... Um, my guess would probably be we'll see some production delays on certain components or we'll see uh, increased costs pass through the supply chain. Um, but better that things like this get caught and taken care of through the legal system than continue to go undetected. So Apple is launching their first, uh, well, they're calling it Apple Silicon Max. We have a MacBook Air, a MacBook Pro, and a Mac Mini. Um, all three of these are shipping in fairly similar configurations and that they're all going to be using the Apple M1, um, which is a mixed 
four high performance, uh, four high efficiency core ARM based design along with their own integrated graphics. Now the MacBook Air specifically is going to ship one model with the graphics uh, detuned to be a seven core design instead of the eight core design that everyone else is getting. The MacBook Air will be shipping a 13.3 inch 2560 by 1600 P3 calibrated screen. As for how much of the gamut we get with that, it remains to be seen, but this is definitely a step up from the sRGB color space panels that were on the Intel based Mac minis. Sorry, Intel based MacBook Airs. Um, beyond that, the I.O. on these is fairly limited, and I really think that's going to be a weak point of at least this first generation of M1 silicon because Apple is using just the SOC in these. We don't see any additional chips to break things out. So you're getting a pair of USB 4 type C's with Thunderbolt 3, 3.5 millimeter audio and touch ID. The only things that the MacBook Pro is gaining is the MacBook Pro will be an active cooling model. So we should expect higher sustained performance for it during long term runs and a larger battery. Um, Beyond that, the MacBook Pro 13 is also going to be gaining the touch bar at the top of the unit. I'm not sure how useful I think that is, but Apple seems to be sticking with it. Uh, beyond that, all three devices are going to ship in either an 8 or 16 gig memory configuration. Not inherently a step down on the MacBooks, but that is a step down on the Mac Mini. Previous Mac Minis had socketed memory that could be upgraded up to 64 gigs of RAM. At this point, the Mac Mini is held to 8 and really, or sorry, held to 8 or 16. And really, it's the Mac Mini that loses here. Um, all the other units did see some sort of tweaking and that, you know, you only get a single display output on those Type-C ports, whereas you may have been able to use two display outputs on the previous Intel models. Um, the Mac Mini still gets an HDMI port, which is good, but it no longer has any of the expandability for more storage and more RAM that made it fairly popular for small server applications where people still wanted to use a Mac and they were using them for, you know, network storage or small ESXi units that would hold multiple versions of Mac OS for software development. Um, so that tangent aside, um, it looks like Apple's M1 Silicon is here, and I can't wait to see the benchmark numbers. It has been a long time since Apple used their own CPUs. The last time we saw this was the PowerPC units, which were developed simultaneously with Motorola and IBM. And IBM still makes power architecture chips. They just went to big iron servers, which is a different evolution than what Apple needed when they switched to Intel in, I believe it was 2006. Uh, so this is not Apple's first time changing architectures and I highly doubt it will be their last. Intel this week is launching the new ZLP and ZHP server GPUs. Uh, ZLP, the models that we're seeing demonstrated are exactly what I predicted last week when I was talking about how Z Max would make a, a great little transcode unit. Be a couple of links to a, a deeper article with links back to the VCAs as well uh, from Serve the Home. But we're seeing it demonstrated with four separate GPUs on a board. And the companies that are going to be interested in things like this, I mean, I am personally, I'd love to put one in my Plex server. Uh, but are going to be companies like Netflix, are going to be companies like Disney with big streaming services where they don't necessarily need it to run games fast. They need it to handle 60 different video streams going through it and turning them into whatever dynamic format the person on the other end needs, be it a 360p stream for a phone or a 4K stream for an 80 inch uh, so we'll say an 8K stream for an 80 inch OLED in someone's living room. Uh, so that's an excellent application of these chips. ZHP, on the other side, is focused on HPC applications. And Intel 
has never had terrible performance for things like OpenCL, um, especially considering how little space integrated graphics gets compared to dedicated graphics chips. But it was never something that they were so great at that they were the first choice. Um, OpenCL isn't as popular as CUDA. Um, it just never seemed to quite get as much attention. And that's not to say that it's useless. It's out in the market and people use it, but it didn't quite get the mind share that CUDA does. Uh, so the mixture of Intel's new GPUs, which are demonstrating big compute numbers, as well as Intel's new One API, which if there was anyone who was going to be able to push a new compute API, Intel has the installed hardware base to do it. Um, and that's not me taking a dig at AMD for their aspirations with things like Vulkan or OpenCL. That's just the acknowledgement that as much as I love high performance graphics cards from AMD and NVIDIA, the bulk of chips out there are going to be integrated graphics in laptops and desktops. Now, if you buy 40 business laptops, you don't need dedicated graphics. You need good enough graphics to run a spreadsheet. So if anyone's going to have the push on the software side to make things more broader and more open, it's going to be Intel, better or worse. Um, the Micron this week announced 176 layer 3D NAND. So, 3D NAND has been here for a while. A lot of the SSDs we've looked at recently have been 3D NAND. Um, various flavors of it. Uh, TLC, we've seen some MLC 3D NAND. Um, I think the QLC drives we've looked at were 3D NAND as well. But it's usually 96 or 128 layer, although I think someone was shipping 64 still. I don't think I got sampled any 64 layer drives, however. Um, so, layers increase density on an SSD and potentially can increase performance depending on how the chips are built uh, without the penalties that we see moving from something like TLC to QLC. So, simply put, if I double my layer count and I don't tank my performance by introducing a ton of latency, I've doubled my density. And this is just a, a vertical stacking uh, the, using 3D NAND allowed them to move back to older processes, avoid some of the issues that the smaller gate sizes on, say, 10 nanometer have, while still increasing performance and increasing density. And it's an excellent thing to see in increase in layer count. I don't actually know what the practical limit on how many layers could theoretically be stacked before it just became absurd, um, but... I mean, 176 is twice what most of the drives that I've seen recently have. I mean, that's 196, or sorry, that's just shy of double what 96 layer NAND would be. So I'm glad to see this. Um, the last two items, these have both been reported by Pocketables. We have... Google is killing their unlimited storage for Google Photos. Um, I'm not happy about it. Obviously, anyone, everyone likes free storage. I'm disappointed to see that they didn't at least decide to keep it on the uh, Pixel phones. The current Pixel phones will continue to have it forever, but they've made no commitment to introducing the new Pixel 6, whenever that shows up, with the unlimited Google Photo storage. That would have made sense as a competitive move. It's a reason to buy a Google phone as opposed to OnePlus or Samsung or LG or, you know, Vivo or et cetera, anyone else. Um, this may not be just a business decision. Google is one of the tech companies that routinely gets beat up on by the EU, by the U.S. government, along with companies like Amazon and Facebook. And uh, this may be a strategic decision on Google's end to look like there's more competition in the market than there really is. Then again, they might not be playing 4D chess. This may just be to cause kind of nudge people towards 
spending more money and try and bundle things in with YouTube Premium, uh, Google One. They've got that VPN that they put in it now. And that brings us to our other news item from Google. Uh, YouTube Premium is offering a free Stata Premiere Edition. I believe this also comes with a free month of Stadia if you are currently a subscriber. So this bundle is a free Chrome Chrome. Eh. This bundle is a free Chromecast Ultra alongside a free Stadia controller. Um, if you are already a YouTube Premium member, I don't see any reason not to get that. Even if you don't want Stadia, even if you have no use for the controller, a free Chromecast Ultra, absolutely. And this may be a holiday drive to try and get people to sign up. This may be them clearing out stock uh, to make room for their new Chromecasts with Android TV. Whatever the mat, whatever the reasoning may be, a free Chromecast is a free Chromecast. That about covers it for the week. Um, once again, don't forget to check out Matt's stream. I'll be watching it myself. And uh, closing out, I want to thank anyone who helps support Pocketables, either by using our Amazon affiliate referral links or on Patreon. It is things like that that helps make content like this possible. Going forward, I think we're going to be moving these news roundups to Saturday. We're going to try and introduce a new weekly tech tip video on Friday. If you have things that you'd like to see us cover in something like that, definitely leave, leave a question in the comments below. And if one of our news stories, I know I kind of ran through some of these quick because we had a lot to cover. If there is something you want covered in more depth or you have questions about, please ask in the comments below. Uh, I also want to thank Electrix for providing our opening and closing themes. And finally, thank you for watching.